Somebody once told me Level Cap Podcast is here to talk to you about some cool Level 99 game stuff, all-star or otherwise. Alright, that was, that was okay. That was not too bad. I'll, I'll accept that. Yeah, I didn't go through the full song, and um, yeah, sorry, I just started singing it because I I created a monstrosity today, I think. Oh no, what happened? Oh, oh right, you weren't online. Okay, so um, somebody in the community, I think it was Vi or V, said that Evil Hikaru's theme is probably just Hikaru's theme, but then Evil Hikaru is talking in the background and like badly remixing it. <laughs> Like, oh man, yeah. So um, I took that idea and I ran with it, and I ended up with this thing. Um, I'm gonna send you a copy of it, um, and I'm probably gonna play a short bit of it for the podcast at this point here. Remix, evil Hikaru remix. Somebody once told me the world was gonna roll me. I ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. She was looking kind of dumb with her finger and her thumb in the shape of an L on her forehead. Well, a year start coming and they don't stop coming. Bent to the rules and I hit the ground running. Did it make sense not to live? Oh dear. Um, well, I, I, I can say that um, for those of you who are afraid, having heard Marco's intro, Evil Hikaru's theme is not just Hikaru's theme with Evil Hikaru rapping in the background. It is its own theme. Uh, and not a remix. Oh, so, okay, that's great. <laughs> sorry about that, but uh, but it is a cool theme. Um, I mean, and, uh, you'll be able to hear it pretty soon when Evil Hikaru comes out. Oh, that's um, great. But uh, before Evil Hikaru comes out, well, I'll tell you about announcements later on. But, yeah, yeah. So um, the long, the long and short of it is, I found like an Evil Hikaru voice, and then I, I like put the lyrics of Smash Mouth's All Star on top of Hikaru's theme, and. That's why that's the intro. So I see. You're welcome. I see. Well, uh, if you're feeling really brave, I guess you can cl- click that link. Yeah, you, you can you can click that link and you can listen to the whole song instead of just the snippet that I put here. So, Brad, how are you? Welcome to the Level Cap Podcast. Yeah, it's good to be back. Yeah, I mean, look, I always go like and pretend that I'm happy that you're here, but it's like I expect you to be here, right? Like, there's no podcast without you. I always pretend that I'm happy that you're here too, but then I'm also actually happy. So it's like, it's like, it's like double, like underneath the surface, there's another layer, but that layer is also like underneath the fake layer, there's a genuine layer, but the genuine layer, the fake layer are the same. So it's like, Mm -hmm. it's like when, you know, like you see through a stained glass window and behind that, there's the actual picture that was, that's in the stained glass. And so it's just, it's basically just painted on the other side of the glass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's I, like I, that. That's our. That's our relationship. Yeah. I see. I think I get that. I'm the stained glass, and then you are the window. And you know what? This metaphor is getting away from me. And our me. friendship is the light. The friendship is the light. Yes. Oh my gosh! It reminded me of a funny thing. I'll, I'll talk about it with what I've been doing. So, um, Brad. Yeah. So tell me what you've been doing, Marco. <laughs> oh wow! Thanks. Oh man. Okay. So for for what I. <laughs> been doing i've been doing two things um let's talk about the one that i was just talking about earlier um so kingdom hearts 3 is coming out right and we talked about this a few a few episodes ago and my partner sent me a video because what they've been doing is actually watching people play through kingdom hearts every single one of the games so not just one not just two but also chain of memories the psp games and so on and so forth yeah do you do you know how many games are actually in that series I think there's like more than six, right? Like one, two, and then four other games. Yeah, there was like there was like one, and then there was maybe like one between one and two, and now there's like there's like ten, if you include the remixes and the phone game that was only in Japan, and oh, um, and it's a mess. It's it's a giant mess. Oh my gosh! Um, I don't even want to play three. Like I loved two, but I don't even want to play three because so much stuff happened in the in the background, and they're either gonna have to just say it all doesn't matter or they're going to have to catch you up and neither one of those is optimal neither one is fulfilling right all of it is trash 
Yeah, so the the thing that's happened was um, they actually stumbled across a video that basically says, so this is basically Kingdom Hearts, and that's the name of the video, and it's like four minutes long, and they essentially like try to summarize um, everything that happens in Kingdom Hearts, and... Uh-huh. I think I think the best part of it all is that it's it's like one of those like um you know honest trailers it's kind of like honest trailers but it's like yeah. way way funnier because they don't try to sound like an epic movie guy anymore so it's kind of like there's this just one scene where he goes like you know Kingdom Hearts's dialogue is just bad it's like really bad if in fact if you just took these five words and then he goes like darkness light friendship heartless and um, keyblade and then you just kind of like roll the dice and then like picked the words based on the dice roll that would be like a kingdom hearts dialogue in fact if you just replace the word darkness with the word bees it would still be the same quality of dialogue and then after saying that the entire video is every time he would refer to the word darkness he replaced it with bees so it's like you know kingdom hearts is about um this guy named ansem and he's filled with bees and he tries to turn sora into a beekeeper by giving him bees and then i'm like oh no and then there's a scene where where goofy betrays like betrays sora and donald and then sora's like oh no goofy why and then goofy's like sora i have become a beekeeper and it will actually happen in kingdom Hearts 2.5 where those five seconds I was dead Ansem actually possessed me with the darkness and created the shadow clone of myself and I'm like this is <laughs> yeah that's um, that's a that's a Kingdom Hearts plot all right oh my gosh wow. it's it's that all right so that that's that's the first oh, thing man. I've been doing <laughs> Oh my gosh. And the second thing I've been doing is actually, um, I finished watching The Dragon Prince. I was talking about it on the previous episode. And yeah, I haven't seen this yet, but I, I'm really excited to check it out. Is, this, is it still good all the way to the end? Oh, it's it's hecka good all the way to the end. And it's one of those things wherein you get a nice conclusion to the first arc, but you know there's more. Because the titular character doesn't appear until the literal last episode. So Those are those are the best, honestly. I... I, I um... There's a, a manga that I really like um, called um, Eremintar Gerard, and it's um, and they the way that they did it was they had like the first arc of the manga mm-hmm. is like you know ten ten books or something, and then they finish the story and they cut it off and like arc two is just it's a diff- it's the same world it's contemporary but it's a different main character on a completely different plot in the same world and a couple of the characters show up as cameos but it's it's another thing. Um, and I really thought that was a, a cool way to do, like, Avatar, you know, they ended Aang's story, they moved straight into Korra's story, and it was, you know, it was an, and it was a different thing. Um, but you still got to experience that world, and you got to experience it in a new way. Yeah, I guess that's um, true. I don't think it'll apply for this one, though. I feel like the main character, like, it's not that, like, the first set of characters end, and then the main character picks up. I think the main character just joins them at the end. And I see. Yeah, so I, I really like I really like the self-contained plot arcs. Like you can watch it, and it's done, and then if you want more of that world, there's another story in that world. Yeah, I think and that's you don't like, have to. You know, that, you don't feel like you've you've got a cliffhanger. I guess that's like the difference between Naruto and Boruto, right? Like it's kind of like that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if like for for Naruto, if they had just cut out all the filler episodes and done Boruto in that slot instead, you know, maybe that would be. It right would actually be it. good. It would actually be good. <laughs> okay, yeah. But um, the thing about... I want to point out two things about the Dragon Prince that I find really interesting. Um, number one is... I mean, I, I know people like rag on this a lot, but I like how... Uh, I can't believe I'm going to use it. I like, I, I like how diverse the show is. Um, mostly because like n- almost no two main characters share the same like ethnicity i think like the only people who do share ethnicity are literal family members and blood relatives but like every set of characters seems to look different so it just, just the show just looks like you know you know it doesn't have that anime syndrome where characters are just you know they're the same character but with just a different hair color you know yeah. what i mean yeah it's yeah like, i know exactly what you mean i think yeah. that's it's really cool and i think that um that's one of the big uh I think big things we've improved with our modern animation that we we're representing more types of people and uh, you know kind of bringing the 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 whole world together because in real life you know like you don't have those those homogenous groups except in Japan I guess uh, because yeah. Japan is pretty much everybody's Japanese yeah. but uh, so <laughs> so I can kind of I guess I can kind of understand how we were like that for so long but 
you know, um, I guess in with American uh, animation, especially, um, you would expect to see a lot more diversity in races. And yeah, uh, I a... think it's really good that, that we're finally getting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think one thing that really like stood out to me in the entire series was uh, there's a de- there's a mute or deaf character. I'm not sure which one it is actually, um, but no, you can't mute's see. where you can't talk, and deaf is where you can't hear. Yeah, yeah. But there's basically no scene in the show wherein like you could make the distinction, right? Like well, I'm not sure whether she's deaf or she can read lips. Lips. It's it's usually usually goes hand in hand because if you're if you're deaf, then you don't you know it's tougher to speak because you can't check you know you can't hear what other people are saying and you can't. Yeah, I you guess. You know, um, check your own work, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I guess. So uh, basically, the only way this character communicates is through American Sign Language. And um, I find that to be very interesting because she actually has another character who walks around with her who translates everything she says from American Sign Language into spoken English. And then I think the coolest part was there are multiple scenes of this character who, wherein the character who translates for her leaves or does something else. So she's literally like, for example, there's a scene where she visits her family member's grave and she literally just goes there and there's like a two to three minute scene of just her at the gravestone, signing at the gravestone, talking to her dead family member. But there's no subs. There's nothing. And it's like, what? And I can't, I couldn't understand anything. And I guess it's just like that stuck to me because like, is this how people who can't hear people speak feel when there are no subs? Like I, it, it kind of like put me in that realm of space that those kind of people that's, with those problems really cool. have. That's really cool. Yeah, man, I really got to watch this show. It's really good. Oh, and number two, this is the second thing I want to point. This is way less like deep. Um, I like the way they do elves. The way they do elves in this show, <laughs> so good. <laughs> because um, okay. all the elves are Irish or Scottish, like either one of those two. So all of like imagine like all the elves are just walking around with Scottish accents. It's so good. <laughs> Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I have to. I gotta see this. Yeah, you gotta watch it. It's so great. Uh, the animation not as bad as I thought it would be. It grows on you, and at some point, I yep. think the style is so good in the sense that you know it makes it look like it's actually two D animation because of the way the characters are modeled. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. So, what have you been doing, Brad? Tell me. Tell me. What have mm-hmm. you been doing? Well, um, I have been getting up earlier. Been going out. I joined. Uh, well, I not joined, but I've finished taking my like uh, CrossFit class trials. So my neighbor goes at like 6 a.m. every morning to do CrossFit and um, I've started joining them for a few days and so I've been getting up real early and doing these these randomized workouts. Um, it's basically like like the roguelike of workouts. They just give you a random workout every day and nice. you have to do it. Procedurally uh, generated <laughs> workouts. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's it's, it's interesting. Um, and I've had a lot of fun doing that and it's nice to wake up early. You know, I always felt like I wanted to be the kind of person that wakes up early and gets to work. And this has given me an excuse because I'm like peer pressured into it now. Oh, so, nice. I like that. So that's, that's a good feeling actually. And, um, so other than that, um, I've been doing a lot of work and it's been Linda's birthday, um, this week. So oh. I've been, uh, going out and doing stuff with her, you know. We That's went fine. Out to a fancy dinner, um, you know. We've got some friends coming over for a cake later on tonight. Um, but yeah, and other than that, um, been playing a bit of Hearthstone. I crafted a gold Whizbang the Wonderful. Oh, oh and oh, if you true you know value. this guy, this card is it's one card, and if you put it in your deck, it randomizes your entire deck, so he gives you a random precon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The thing about Gold cards in Hearthstone is if a gold card generates other cards, so those cards are also gold. So you only have to craft one gold with Bang the Wonderful to get an entire gold deck. Value. Um, True yeah, value. Real, real value. <laughs> with so, Bang's fun. And I, it's, it's really fun. And I've enjoyed playing the random decks. Like they're just the pre con formula decks, but they're pretty fun. Yeah. Um, and it's good class, a, right? Yeah. It, it gives you a nice breadth of like what's available in Hearthstone because. Like I've never, I don't have the cards to play some of the the you know more meta decks, but Wizbang comes with them, so I can play like all these rares that I don't own, and it's pretty neat. Yeah, it's a pretty fun card. Um, all right, so Brad, you've been doing anything else? I mean, aside from Wizbang, the wonderfully. So I played. Um, so I went last weekend, and I went and visited Josh, and we played 
basically all of the Toho games from like Seven Ford and a bunch of other shmups, which if you're not familiar with this genre, these is like the space shooter genre. Do you uh, know yeah, shmups, yeah. Marco? Yeah, like Toho, right? Well, yeah, Toho is probably the like the you know the most famous example, but it's still pretty obscure to most people. Um, these are games where you have a spaceship and you you know fly you fly back and forth and you shoot enemies, kind of the the uh, you know the successors to Space Invaders, right? Uh, that genre. Yeah, but they, these usually are like tied with like the more commonly known like bullet hell genre, right? Yeah, yeah, they're called uh, yeah Bullet Hell or Don Maku, and they're these are games where it's really mostly about survival. You just have to dodge the bullets that the enemy is throwing at you. Yep, yep. And so enemies often throw these very, um, you know, not super fast, but slow and often artistic and uh, often uh, very very difficult to thread. You know, thread the needle kind mm. of uh, games so, or kind of uh, kind of gameplay. Anyway, it was really cool. It was really enlightening to kind of experience a crash course in this genre. One of the things that we have been talking about internally for a long time is uh, bringing this genre to board game form. And it's something that Josh has really been uh, excited to do um, as a big fan of the series. So we spent some time working on that, talking about it, and figuring out kind of how we want to represent the genre on the tabletop. Mm, I'd be interested in that. Maybe it's like, let's just rip off Android Android Netrunner. Uh, that was it. Was one of the things that we had discussed was doing a you know a card game kind of like Netrunner. But we have some different ideas. We've had a lot of ideas. Been thinking and talking about this for a while now. But oh. uh, hopefully things are coming together soon. I haven't gotten the results of their playtesting yet, but we put together a prototype and uh, Josh went to playtest it yesterday. So we'll see how his results are now. Ooh, results. I, I can't wait. I mean, look, here's the thing. You, you guys have so much in the pipeline that I want to play. Seventh Cross. And, like, now you're adding this? What are you doing to me, Brad? What are you doing? Well, I mean, what are we going to do after Seventh Cross, right? Uh, that's true. That's true. Like, Seventh Cross is, is getting to the point where it's about finished. And um, so, you know, we got to start thinking about the next thing. And we've got a few things in the works, but uh, got to gotta keep looking towards the future. All right, looking towards the future. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about, or can we move to the future of this podcast? Let's, uh, yeah, let's move forward to the future of the Level Cap Podcast. All right, welcome everyone to the mystical land known as the Pipeline, where Brad talks about development, production, or maybe even some other stuff relating to Level Ninety Nine games. What are we talking about today, Brad? What aspect of Level Ninety Nine are we gonna tell the listeners about? Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about game balancing, uh, specifically balancing online. So recently, um, I would say recently, but with uh, Exceed Season 2 and onward. So, you know, um, everything in uh, Dev Remastered, Wanderers, Imperial, pretty much every game that we've, you know, had into the pipeline before since since, uh, Exceed Season 2 has been balanced online. And mm-hmm. some of you in the community may know Andril, uh, Daniel Honig. He is our uh, lead balance uh, designer and developer. And so we, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we came to that arrangement, what we do for online balancing when we bring something to online balance, and uh, how we know um, how we know when things are ready to go. All right. Anyway, so to so, so get started, um, I wasn't really. We'd always had online balance through our playtest forums, but between all of my other responsibilities, uh, there was never really anybody to manage it. I could upload a thing, but getting everybody's feedback and making sure that it got integrated and that, you know, that the, the feedback was good, because a lot of people, you know, you play a game once or twice, you have a knee-jerk reaction, you post your thoughts, and then you leave. Um, you know, so it was hard to get a gauge on which players were, you know, giving skilled feedback as to which ones were giving, you know, initial feedback. Those are the kind of metrics that uh, you really just have to be involved with the community to understand. Mm-hmm. And um, so Daniel was a uh, tournament player in a lot of our games, and I met him at uh, the Gen Con Worlds for BattleCon one year, and um, you know, and through. Uh, you know, very through the Discord chat and um, and other venues, you know, we started talking about design and balance and stuff. And uh, eventually, I got to the point where I said, like, like, hey, I really need some help. 
I, I don't have time to balance all these things. I need somebody who knows the ins and outs of the games, who wants to solidify the rules, who wants to, you know, handle, like, being the rules lawyer and being the definitive rules voice for all these games. Uh, can you do it? And he was like, yeah, that's, that's good. I want to do this. So we got into that arrangement, and now um, we have a, a, a pipeline. You know, I, we build a prototype. We test it here locally in person to make sure that we've got the fun factor there, to make sure that everybody, if all the characters are interesting to play as and against, to make sure that the fundamentals of gameplay are solid. Yeah. And then we take that prototype, we give it to Alice, who puts it into Tabletop Simulator. And then once it's in Tabletop Simulator, we hand it to the community and Daniel uh, manages the community to you know make sure that all the characters are played evenly, that balance changes get in. He takes balance changes that uh, that are recommended, sends them back to Josh. Josh makes a new iteration of the prototype, sends it back to Alice, and we iterate that way, uh, generally about once a month on a project. Uh, sometimes a little more quickly if there are you know immediate breaks in a gameplay, and that's how we do our game balancing. Wow. And, uh, yeah, and I think we're going to have a, a discussion with Daniel in the near future where he talks about the actual nuts and bolts of the balancing internally. Um, I'm more familiar with the, you know, the entire um, global process of how balancing development works. Yeah, um, it, it must be really hard because, you know, as a Battlecon veteran of like, what, five years? Like, I would say I have an idea of balance, but like, I want to be able to do Daniel's job, like... I don't know, man. I wouldn't be able to balance these games. <laughs> it's it's tough. It's really tough. And he does a really great job. I mean, if you played Exceed Season 1 and you played Exceed Season 2, um, you can see, like, the world of difference, right? Like, in the Exceed, first Exceed tournament, we had, like, um, I want to say, like, maybe six or seven characters represented. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those were really heavily represented. Like on, Malian, uh, in our, in our or... topic, yeah, like Malian, Alice, Lily, um, those characters showed up a whole bunch. In season two, uh, Exceed, um, our top eight had was represented by like eighteen different fighters. Oh, that's so, so good. And it's not just the you know it's not just the that there were more fighters in the pool because you know the cream floats to the top and everybody wants to play who they think is the best fighter in a competitive scene. So the fact that we had 18 different people make it to top eight in a, you know, in a full tournament was, or 18 different fighters make it to top eight in a full tournament is uh, pretty impressive. So, yeah. and I think it speaks to the quality of Daniel's work. Yeah. It's, oh my gosh. So good. So good. You know what? I, I, I have a, I, I had a cool story about balancing with Daniel before really quick right but yeah go for it there was a point in time where in um we were doing exceed season two play testing and he was fishing for um you know play testers for specific characters and uh, i ended up um fishing for minato because i'm a sucker for like the yakuza theme and he basically looks like japanese michael jackson so how could i not play this character right so i ended up playing minato and i think it was through course of that gameplay that i figured out the minato loop or the, the Milato loop, as we now call it. Um, so I actually figured out that tech. And I don't think like anybody else had figured it out before. Or at least like somebody knew Minato could mill people, but not infinitely via via like the loop that I found. And so I told Daniel about it. It's like, are we okay with keeping this in the game? Because I just literally did this. And then he was like, huh. And then at that point, I thought he was going to remove it. And then when the next patch came out, not only did Daniel not remove it, Daniel actually had the support for it. <laughs> so it was so good. Wow. That's yeah. great. That's, that's that's really great. That's so good. So now, like, that mill loop that I thought was a bug or something ended up being an integral part of Minato's character now, which is why his um his cab stand boost is the way it is. Awesome. Well, that's really that's really cool. Um, and I think it's, it just goes to show, you know, like, some things that... Uh, you know, that if we didn't have someone dedicated to making all the characters, like to supporting this, we would have to say, well, I can't balance that. I got to take it out. Um, so, but Daniel really, uh, really, you know, made it a feature of the character. So, yeah, that's cool. Exactly. Well, um, so like after going back to playtesting, what I, one of the things I want to say is that um, 
Playtesting doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it's not just Daniel. Um, it is a huge community effort, and it's a lot of playtesters that get involved, that play the games, that uh, that give feedback and support. So um, I want to say thanks to everybody who's played our games in advance. We just put some really exciting license properties into our playtesting uh, circuit. So you can um, get a preview of the next season of Exceed if you are interested in jumping into playtesting. And the way to do that is, uh, Marco, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, so if you want to jump into playtesting, right, uh, usually it's now via, we used to have like the online playtesting boards, right? Um, but that's been a little bit a little bit less active compared to our new playtesting forum, which is now the Discord server. So if you want to get in on playtesting, uh, I recommend that you click on the Discord link down below, which is available on every single episode of the podcast. Join the official Level 99 Discord and ask how you can become a playtester. And we will give you the um, NDA form and you can sign it, and then you can get into the secret channel where we post all of the cool previews of the new characters, the new seasons of Exceed. Um, if you want to see the Wanderers characters in advance or any of the Battlecon characters that aren't even out yet, or maybe even the possible stretch goals, they're also probably there. So it's like, you know, being a play tester is its own reward because you get to play with all of these cool new toys before everybody else does. And there, but there are additional rewards beyond that. You can log uh, playtest games of for... Course. Uh, for organized play program so you can get the organized play promos through play testing yeah and um yeah and uh, sometimes we do special promotions like for imperial we did a uh, a special play testing promotion yeah which so, is um which was if you play tested enough you would get like an upgrade to your pledge right yeah you got the, the free upgrade to deluxe edition so 40 dollar value for you know just for playing 10 games of imperial which is is not too much work and it takes a lot of time but it's it's fun work right? yeah yeah i mean you're playing game right if you're not enjoying the game like maybe maybe there was a mistake somewhere right yeah but in the end of the yeah. day like we we reward our playtesters very much with um with all of the organized play support and you know just the previews i think i think that's the cool thing about playtesters they just sometimes want to play just to see the new stuff and like even if there was an OP, I'm pretty sure like at least eighty percent of our playtesters would still play the playtest stuff, and it's just it's just cool. Our community is great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to get involved. So hope that I'll see you there. Yeah, hopefully. All right. Are you? Do you want to talk any about anything else about playtesting or? I think that we're we're good on this. Let's travel forward to the future of the future of the Level Cat Podcast. Ah, yes, the future, future, also known as Ninety Nine Questions, where we are secretly your grandfather, travel back in time, and then become you, so that you can ask these questions. But aha, we already know the answer because we already knew the question. Brad, are you ready? To answer. I'm not ready after that. I was ready, but then that happened, and now I'm not ready. But I, I like it. I liked it better when we were pouring, when we boiled the questions in a kettle and then poured them into your ear or something like that. Temporal recursion. A less surreal. Oh, okay, fine, fine, fine. How about? <laughs> how about there's an ans- there's a question slip, and now we are answering in voice. Is that metaphor good enough for you? I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> All right. Hey, Brad. Here's question number one. Various fans have seen the Grand Chronicle and said this. Can we get a PDF version of the Grand Chronicle? We would absolutely pay for it. Yeah, I think that that is something we can definitely make available uh, in time. It probably won't be available as part of the Kickstarter because Kickstarter doesn't give us a great mechanism to deliver digital content to backers. But um, we could put it up on DriveThruRPG or we could put it up as a Steam DLC on Battlecon Online or both of those things. Um, you know, Steam supports also having digital art books for your games. So really, um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to distribute that PDF. And I think we want to get it into everybody's hands who wants to have it. Even though we can only print a limited copy and we're only going to print the number that we need to give away for the Kickstarter, we do want everybody to get a chance to read it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, mm, can't wait for that sweet, sweet evil Hickory page. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Oh, man. Yeah, if there's not enough memes in it, I'm going to be very disappointed. Are you ready for the next question, Brad? Go ahead, go for it. I noticed that Karen has updated art in Battlecon Online. Will this be carried over to the Devastation update, or does she keep her old art? So Karen, yeah, so Karen got some new art because her stand-up actually did not fit in the placard on 
BattleCon online. And I know if you see some of the characters like Cesar, you may find that hard to believe. Like, how could anybody not fit if Cesar fits with that ridiculous weapon? Um, but anyway, we so we, we did some changes to Karen's art and changed her stance a bit. Um, so the new stance is really good for online, but it is a bit of a weaker stance. She doesn't have quite the footing that her that her original counterpart had or her original art had. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to portray Karen as as a stronger character that she is, I want I probably want to keep the original art where she has that more solid footing and that more combat ready pose. Even though it doesn't work quite as well for Battlecon Online, it works fine for the cards. Um, yeah. That said, it's going to depend on what best fits the space and um, and all that. We are planning to redo Voco's art, though, um, for a similar reason. That power slide that he does doesn't work very well for the physical card game because it places his head in a different area than all of the other characters' heads are placed. So when we're placing the art on the cards, we try and make sure that the character's um, head is always in the same portion of the card, even if their pose is a little different. Um, and that helps us to keep scale and make sure that everybody feels consistent in terms of size. Mm, yeah. Voco did seem a bit weird, like, on my copy of Old Devastations. I can't wait for this it's, new Voco it, his, art. His stance, his, his um, yeah, the, the, that, like, kneeling down stance just, it, there's something about it that doesn't work as well for the physical game. Yeah. Yeah, I can understand why Karen doesn't fit in the online one, though, because um, Karen's pose in, in physical, or at least the the printed Karen art has her kind of like a bit hunched over, right? And she would yeah, she's like leaning in to to attack. Yeah, so it would look kind of quote unquote weird on the on the way the on the way it's presented in BattleCon Online. So I can understand that. I can understand that for sure. All right, here's the last question. I I, I actually picked this one because I found it r relatively funny. Um, Kimbe is an arc mage of Relicor, yet in both of her game appearances, she can't ever seem to keep a grasp on her staff. Does it have a mind of its own, or does Kimbe just have butterfingers? Yeah, so um, the the staff does have a bit of a mind of its own. Um, it's called Skybreaker, and it was formed from fulgurite that was created during a lightning storm, which Kimbe created. So Kimbe's specialization is ecomancy. She's actually, um, like, if you've played Pendros in Battlecon, and you want to say, well, what's a really high-level Pendros look like? Kimbe is... Like is high level Pendros. <laughs> I see. Uh, so if you want to be a better Pendros, just drop Pendros entirely and play Kimbe instead. Is that what you're saying? No, exactly. But that's that's generally the idea. You know, you see a character who is you know who's kind of more low level, and then you see a character who is more uh, advanced in their art. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so yeah, so Kimbe's uh, main skill is Ecomancy, and she can control weather. So um, anyway. So that's so sh that's uh, that's where she uses like lightning and earthquakes and stuff as her main uh, t types of attack. Now, um, anyway, so yeah, so the staff has a bit of a mind of its own. It has its own ideas about where to go and what to do. Sometimes these line up with uh, Kimbe's own ideas. Sometimes they don't, and the staff wanders off um, and finds some other someone else. Uh, Kimbe can communicate with the staff, but it's not. Uh, it's not quite like its own entity. Uh, it's more like, you know, uh, you get hints of what it's seen or done while it's away. I see. So is this like the in-lore explanation as to why Kimbe's staff gives the opponent power when you stand on it? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's like, oh, this person's, this person's interesting. I'll give them power and see what happens. Probably okay, so... a bit of a curious personality. Oh, so the staff is kind of like... Okay, so I, I get it. So it's like the staff is like a curious kid right it's kind of like that it's like yeah it doesn't really understand the uh you know like like uh kimbe's mission of of defeating evil spellcasters <laughs> so i see so it sometimes works against her is is what you're essentially saying because yeah it's just it's just good training right i see okay so i guess the real question here is like does that mean at some point, like, the staff gets under control? Like, at some point, can Kimbe get good enough or strong enough with the staff that the staff obeys what she wants? Or is the staff always going to be kind of like, you know, like a dog? Why, it... why are you treating the, the, the staff like an object under Kimbe's control? The staff is to own person. It'll decide what it wants to be and where it wants to go and whether it's going to obey Kimbe or not. 
I see. Oh man, that's such a cool thing. That's so cool. So it's like the staff has its own will, so to speak. Or yeah, that's so cool. It's kind of like those ancient artifacts in D and D that you find that are like living artifacts that have their own yeah. will, like that. It's kind of like that. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. That's so cool. That just made Kimbe even more awesome. I mean, aside from the fact that she's like a four foot ten lady wearing high heels all the time. <laughs> Kimbe's a Kimbe's a pretty cool character. We did a I think we did a full lore segment on her in a previous episode. Yeah, we did a full lore lore segment about her and we also did like um like a, a cool analysis of why she wears heels and stuff. Oh my gosh. Yeah. She's yeah. she's a fun character and uh probably one of my favorite in in World of Indians. Yeah, she's pretty cool. And and her her alternate costume in BCO is hilarious. Oh my so God. we we have some other planned costumes for her. And actually one of the stretch goals in uh Battlecon Unleashed is gonna be uh Super Sorcerer and Kimbi. Um so, which is has got her in uh a sort of how do you wanna say, um armor reminiscent of a famous anime about shooting laser blasts at your opponent. Oh. Mm. Okay, let's let's not spoil that. It's gonna be um, okay. Yeah, but we have some some cool uh, Kimbe costumes planned. Oh, that's so. great! I, I love I love Kimbe. I love the I love the lore quips in all of the art. Kimbe's lore quip is the best in her art, uh, where it goes like I think it's like I don't know the name of the elite Kimbe skin, but it's just like her wearing what looks like like a phantom thief thing with thigh high boots. Yeah, and then the, the the it just says like you know when you're an archmage of Relcor, not a lot of people can complain about what you're wearing. Yeah. Then once you're once you're the archmage, you can wear whatever you want, and nobody can say anything about it. Oh my gosh, it's so yeah. true! It's so true. It's All great. Right. It's great. All right, so that pretty much does it for the 99 questions segment. If you guys have any questions for me or for Brad, please put it in the comment section down below or write it in the Google form, which is always linked in the description of this podcast. And unfortunately, Brad, as much as I'd like to keep shooting the breeze with you, I finally used that idiom correctly. We have to end this episode of the Level Cap the Podcast. Breeze, the breeze has been shot and is now is now ready to be buried along with this this episode of the Level Cap Podcast. Wait, are we putting this episode to bed? Is that what that means? Like, is, when, kill, when you kill something? We're putting this episode in the ground. No, oh, six feet which under. Which is to say in the secret underground servers where it is served to users all around the world directly into their hot-baked ears. Hot-baked with ears? Tea. I don't know. I'm, I don't do this as good as you, Marco. I'm sorry. You, see, the first prerequisite is that you need to be a non-native English speaker so you can use all of these fancy idioms without completely understanding what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Uh, right? 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 All right. I guess so. I guess that must be the, the key. The key The key is to I'll not understand. I'll keep working to achieve that. Yeah, of course. Simply reduce your knowledge of the English language. <laughs> And therefore, you might be able to make cool metaphors like me. I'm pretty sure that's how some poets did it. All right. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Level Cap Podcast. As usual, it has been me, your host, Marco DeSantos, also known as Mechanic Critic. And with me has been my amazing co-host, Hot Baked Off the Press. Brad Telt. And... We would like to see you all again next week. Again, reminder, if you're listening to this episode of the podcast, we will be having a stream for BattleCon Unleashed on Friday and Saturday, 4 p.m. PST. Yeah, we'll see you there. Thanks so much for all your support. And as usual, happy gaming. Don't forget your special action. And thank you, World of Indians. Thank you. And good night. night.